So next home, let's give a bananas, amazing, heartfelt welcome for our closing keynote speaker for today, New York Times best-selling author, Dave Kerfman. I know I'm feeling super orange. Thank you for having me, Keith. Thank you for having me next home. I'm super excited to spend 45 minutes with you and then we're all gonna party orange style. I cannot wait. <laughs> Keith mentioned a little surprise with social media and uh, my roots in entrepreneurship are in social media. So what I want you all to do is get out your phones if your phones aren't out yet and log into your Twitter, your Insta, or your LinkedIn. If you're really old school, I guess you can go Facebook. <laughs> and I'm gonna ask you guys to share once or twice throughout the presentation, hashtag it next 2023. At the end of the presentation, I'm gonna choose one lucky winner who is uh, posting with the hashtag next 2023, and that person will win this fabulous bottle of French Champagne valued at over $500. Keep in mind that's hotel rates on alcohol, so <laughs> might be like $50 at home, but it's 500 here. Thanks again for having me today. I'm going to be sharing uh, so, some of my story and some lessons learned along the way. I have never worked in real estate. However, I do identify as a longtime salesperson and a longtime entrepreneur. How many of you guys think of yourself as salespeople? Make some noise if you're a salesperson. <laughs> Thank you. And make some noise if you're an entrepreneur. So we salespeople and we entrepreneurs need to stick together, whether it's real estate or whatever industry that we are in going to share some lessons learned along the way. Hopefully, uh, at least one or two resonate with you. So I started off in the beginning. Uh, I went to college in Boston. And uh, Boston in the house. Nice. And uh, like many college students, I had no money. And I was a big sports fan. So I took a job working at uh, the ballpark. Boston Garden, where the Celtics and Bruins play, and Fenway Park, where uh, the Red Sox play, of course, as a ballpark vendor. Now, I don't know if you guys know uh, that much about the ballpark vending business, but it's a cutthroat business, and you are paid only on commission. You are only paid based on how much you sell, and it's a seniority-based model. So you got to work for years to get, like, the hot dogs or the beer. That's where the big money's at. And consequently, my very first day on the job, I was literally the low person on the totem pole, and I got assigned the worst selling product in the building, a product called Crunch and Munch, which is, <laughs> we have some Crunch and Munch fans. Well, that's a surprise. Crunch and Munch buttery toffee popcorn with peanuts. Fun fact, it's part of a family of, uh, a category of products where every single competitor in the category has a ridiculous sounding name. So you've got Crunch and Munch, Cracker Jack, Fiddle Faddle, and Poppycock. <laughs> and those are the four products that go head to head in the category. Anyway, my first day on the job, I sold a grand total of eight boxes. I got paid the legal minimum that they could pay me of $20. And it was fun to be at the ballpark, but I wanted I wanted to make some money, right? That's what I was there to do. So I came back the second day with a shtick. In order to get people's attention, I started singing, dancing, throwing some boxes around, 
God is my witness, I had absolutely zero talent. However, I had the courage to be different. The courage to stand out, potentially make a fool of myself. And I think I did make a fool of myself at times. And some people hated me, but other people liked me. And that year, the uh, Boston Bruins and the Celtics were both in last place. And so not only did some people like me, but uh, the media noticed, and I was written up in the Boston Herald. And the one smart thing I did as the Cruncher Munch guy was, the day that I was written up in the Boston Herald, somebody who probably uh, brought a Sharpie in order to get an autograph from a player, but couldn't get an autograph from a player, said to me, hey Dave, can you sign a box of my Crunch and Munch? Okay, so sure, I signed a box of Crunch and Munch, but the one smart thing I did was I said, do you mind if I borrow the Sharpie for the rest of the night and I'll give it back to you at the end of the night? And I proceeded to sign every box of Crunch and Munch that I sold that night, unsolicited. And in just one night, I created the perception that not only did you need to buy a box of Crunch and Munch from the Crunch and Munch guy, you needed to get it signed. Sales skyrocketed, as you can imagine. I went from making $20 that first night to making over $1,000 a night, which as a college student was obviously pretty awesome. I have a couple of uh, highlights for a share of you. <laughs> yeah. And um, over at Fenway Park, they actually didn't sell uh, Crunch and Munch, it, it was uh, a Coca-Cola was my main product, so I used my great talents to sell Coke there. <laughs> but really, like I said, I did not have any special talents. All I had was the courage to be different. And we're all scared of lots of things all the time. I'm scared of giving a keynote to a thousand crazy orange people. <laughs> but when we... <laughs> Yeah, give it up for crazy orange people! But when, but when we have the courage to be different, to stand out from others, yeah, some people might not like it, but some people will. Your tribe will. Those are the people that you end up working with. Those are the people that you end up hiring. Those are the people that you end up building your business with. So I maxed out what you could do as a ballpark vendor and I had to get a real job after all my parents had paid for college. So after uh, uh, leaving ballpark vending business, I took a job working at Radio Disney in Boston. Fun picture. Now, uh, what a lot of you, anyone know Radio Disney? It's actually no longer here, but for those of you that know Radio Disney, it was a very interesting AM radio station that did not, uh, did not show up in the Arbitron ratings ever. And if you tuned into the radio station, it was actually very hard to hear it cleanly. So I had a couple moments as a salesperson for Radio Disney where I actually walked into an office and I was trying to sell Radio Disney and the prospect literally put on the radio and heard <laughs> And I was like, well, I guess I'm not getting this sale. But I worked very hard at standing out and uh, as Keith mentioned earlier, being persistent. I want to tell you guys a little story about Brenda Fuentes. Uh, now, Brenda Fuentes was one of my uh, prospects at the time. I, I was given a list of like 100 target prospects to call. This is pre-internet. There was a business world pre-internet. And I had to call up these prospects, try to get a meeting, try to sell them. Brenda Fuentes was the marketing director for Burger King in Boston for the entire Northeast region. and so. It was my job to call Brenda Fuentes, book a meeting, sell her Radio Disney. So I called her up. What did I get when I called? Voicemail. Voicemail. Um, called her up a second time the next day, voicemail again. What I decided to do was call her every single day. And once a week, because every day would be too much, leave a creative voicemail for her, singing to the tune of one of the hit songs on Radio Disney. So I would sing something like, Oops, I called you again. You didn't pick up. No, no, not this time. Oop, Brenda, Brenda, oops, I called you again. Hey, I did tell you guys earlier I have no, no talent when it comes to singing. I, I did warn you. 
So I called her every day, left voicemail every, every week. Um, some of my colleagues made fun of me for, for doing that. Again, I, it was being different. But seventh week, phone call number 37. Guess who picked up the phone? Brenda Fuentes picked up the phone. She said, are you ever going to stop calling me and leaving me those crazy voicemails? I am now, Brenda Fuentes. Let's talk. I closed her for $50,000. I got a $10,000 commission check, and I was off to the races. So the moral of the story, be persistent and be creative. That's lesson number two, slide two for those of you that are playing. Awesome, thank you. Be passionate, be passionate, be persistent. It's hard to know when I would have given up and it's hard to know when to give up, I get that, but there's a very, very long trail of former salespeople, entrepreneurs, real estate agents that gave up. We're the ones in the room that don't give up. We're the run, ones in the room that are persistent and that's why you're here and that's why you're gonna be successful. Okay, next lesson is like super tactical, but it's the one that I actually get the very most feedback um, in, in my book, The Art of People on, so I thought I would share this with you. Whilst a, a Radio Disney salesperson, I had a, uh, first of all, I was 60 pounds heavier than I am today. That's an important part of the story. And I, I had a tendency to run late for meetings. I was always running around doing all these things. And I had a pitch meeting uh, with, a, uh, with a bank that I was pitching. Um, We'll just call them State Street, because that's their name. <laughs> and I was running late. I came to, um, I, came, I finally got in. I was like 15 minutes late. And the, the, the prospect from State Street offered me a glass of water. And I didn't take it because I didn't want to start any later. I didn't want to make things any worse. Um, I didn't want to put them out. But on the other hand, I was in like a full sweat. <laughs> and by not taking the water, I kind of like didn't calm down and I made a complete mess of myself and I lost the business. And after that moment, I decided to run a little non-scientific experiment. And the next 20 meetings that I took, I alternated between always taking the water or whatever the, the, the prospect offered me and saying no, no thank you, don't worry about it, I'm fine. Well, guess what happened? Those folks that actually gave me the water were like three times more likely to close as clients. So I got to studying this and I, and I, and I realized the psychological principle that's at play here. I think to, to, to drive the point home, I wanna put you in the opposite shoes, you're hosting at your house and a friend comes over and you say, come on in, would you like some water? Would you like some tea? Can I offer you something? And they say, nah, no thanks, I'm good. How does that make you feel as the host? Lousy. What, what, you don't want my water? My, my, my iced tea's not good enough for you? So by taking the water, you actually put the prospect at ease. You make them feel good. You make them feel comfortable. And that's why I say, thank you guys, always take the water. Or iced tea, or even depending on the situation, beer, depending on, <laughs> depending on the situation. Tonight, take the beer. So I was, uh, so I was at Radio Disney uh, for two years. I was fortunate enough uh, after a lot of hard work and I'm sure lots of luck to become the number one salesperson uh, in the country until this woman started working at my office. And uh, within three months, she dropped me to number two. I was uh, completely um, impressed by this woman. Uh, I had met my match. I had finally met someone that, you know, could equal or frankly outdo me in all things. 
And of course, I fell madly in love with her. But there was one ever so slight problem. And as an entrepreneur, I always try to solve problems, but this was a slight problem. She was married already. <laughs> okay, so this is where I, I, I get to the super, honestly, serious part of the, 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 the presentation. Um, and I, I, I don't know how much this lesson will necessarily help us all with our real estate business, but I know for me, this has been the most important lesson that I've ever learned in my life. You know, I was, I was in love with someone that couldn't, um, that couldn't re re return. And it was a very, very hard situation for me, the hardest situation I've ever had. And ultimately, the lesson that I learned was to let go of what, uh, what I can't control. It's a hard lesson. It's a hard lesson for all of us. But it's, it, like I said, it's been the most important lesson of my life. Um, I'm not an AA guy, but I love, love, love the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. I realized that the relationship could not be, and I had to let go of, of the person um, and stop, stop talking to her. And um, I am going to continue with that story in a little while, but I'm going to leave you in suspense for the moment <laughs> and go on to a couple more lessons that I've learned um, while fundraising. So I'm guessing not, not, not uh, too many of us in the room have done professional fundraising for our businesses, but for my software uh, company, I had to raise uh, several million dollars, and fundraising was really, really hard. It's like sales. Um, it's like recruiting, um, but I think... The reason I find it so hard is I'm asking people for money for air, for the promise of potentially part of something. But that's, that's, that's definitely been the hardest thing ever for me to sell. So a couple of lessons I've learned along the way throughout, throughout my fundraising. This first one um, is me on an airplane. And every airplane that I'm on, every train that I'm on, every bus that I'm on, Every conference that I'm at, I take an opportunity to talk to every single person that I can. And when I talk to people, I focus on them and I focus on asking them questions. Not, what's the weather like? Uh, not like, uh, what do you do? Although, what do you do is an early question, I get it. But questions that really get people talking about what matters to them. So I met this guy named Steve on a plane, got to talking to him, got to asking him questions. He was a corporate lawyer with two kids. He had been married for 12 years. He um, had some trouble in his marriage, but he was working through it, getting to a better place. And um, his favorite charity was the MS Society, which is important charity to me because um, I have some family members with MS. We bonded over that. I just kept asking him questions and he just kept sharing. Because the thing is, people love to talk. <laughs> and all we need to do is ask questions and shut up and listen. Ask questions, ask good questions, questions that really get people sharing about what matters to them, and shut up and listen to them. And at the end of the, the plane ride, Steve turned to me and he said, it's been so great getting to know you. Yeah, exactly. Meanwhile, I was thinking, you literally don't know a thing about me. He said, it's been so great getting to know you. And then he realized for a moment, he said, wait, actually, what do you do again? <laughs> again? Well, you never ask. Um, I said, well, actually, I'm, a, I'm a, an entrepreneur, and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, starting a new software company, and I'm doing some fundraising, if you happen to know anyone. And he said, huh, fundraising. Well, I, I have some money put aside. I'll, 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 I'll tell you what, I'll write you your first check. He wrote me my first check for $10,000. Not a lot, but you know what? I earned that just by asking good questions and shutting the hell up. It's easier than we think sometimes. We think it's about us. It's not about us. It's about the prospect or the recruit or whoever it is that we're talking to and really giving them a chance to feel heard, 
to feel listened to, to feel genuinely cared about. And by the way, you can't fake it. I mean, you can try to fake it, but I genuinely, when I ask questions, I genuinely, sincerely care about the other person. And I think that shows, and I think that they appreciate the genuine curiosity. So when we can be curious about other people, it ends up paying off. Okay, next lesson in fundraising. Definitely my favorite one to share today with y'all. So normally I do the, and I'll, I'll give you the punchline on this, it's, it's, about, it's about the orange shoes. And normally I do this presentation um, and I am 100% of the time the only guy in the room with orange shoes. <laughs> and so, so, I, so I get to the lobby earlier today um, to check in and within three minutes I see seven people with orange shoes. <laughs> and I'm like, that whole piece about how it's important to be different with orange shoes. Yeah, exactly. But, but hopefully, hopefully this will still resonate with respect to whatever your own version of orange shoes is. Um, our original logo um, for, for, for my uh, first company was a blue thumb. Our lawyer looked, up, looked at us and said, uh, that looks just like Facebook's logo, so you need to change it. We changed it to an orange thumb. I fell immediately in love with orange, which is the absolutely most positive persuasive color. I am a huge, huge fan of orange. And I started, I bought a couple of pairs of orange shoes. Now, I had been told that the best way to meet investors was through uh, mutual uh, intro, an intro from a mutual connection. So I wanted to meet this guy, Dave McClure. Dave McClure was a, um, was a, a, a venture capitalist um, who invested in startups. And I got introduced to him by mutual connection, like I'm supposed to. And so I sent him this email. Thanks so much, Victoria, for introducing us. So great to meet you, Dave. Look forward to uh, having, setting up a phone call with you and talking about my new business. I get an automated email response from Dave that says, I no longer respond to emails because I get too many. Find a more creative way to get a hold of me. Yeah, that's a pain in the ass. But, of course, I'm up for the challenge. So I, um, I see that he's speaking at a conference in New York. He's from Silicon Valley, but I see he's speaking at a conference in New York. I buy a $1,000 ticket to this conference thinking, okay, I'll learn a lot, plus I'm going to get to meet him, I'm going to pitch him, he's going to invest in us, it's going to be great. He'll remember the mutual connection, he'll put it all together. So it turns out like 600 other entrepreneurs had this idea to meet him and the other VCs in the room. And I go all day and every single opportunity to potentially meet him, there's a crowd of 20 to 30 entrepreneurs waiting in front of me and I miss out on every opportunity to meet Dave. It's 5.30 p.m. I am so upset. I have just wasted a day of my life, a thousand bucks, I'm so upset, I'm waiting online, as anyone this upset would be, for a drink at the bar. And all of a sudden I hear, I need to meet the man wearing those mother effing shoes. <laughs> and I look up, and there's Dave McClure, looking to meet me. They wrote me a check for $250,000 next week. Now, I'm not going to say it's exactly precisely because I wore the orange shoes that they wrote a check, but it's definitely precisely because I wore the orange shoes that he walked up to me in a time where everyone else was pitching him and walking up to him. And since then, I've started collecting orange shoes. <laughs> that is actually <laughs> from a while ago. This, this Chanel pair my wife got me is pair number 96. So yes, I know I have a problem. But I talked about the opportunity um, to start conversations in trains and planes everywhere I go. This, especially for introverts out there, and there are some introverts out there that go into business. Um, a signature style, give it up for the introvert. Let's give her some uh, public attention, just what she wants. No, um, it, it's a conversation item. I mean, basically almost every single day, 
Every single day I take the Long Island Railroad to commute into New York City, somebody says, wow, love your shoes, and I start a conversation. It's a free conversation starter. So my question for you is, what is your signature style? What is your version of the orange shoes? How can you adopt, and it could be orange, it could be orange shoes, it could be, what is that, a necklace? Awesome. I, I worked with a woman who, who wore pearls all the time. Uh, another guy wore, wears a purple tie all the time. A handkerchief, certain glasses, a hat, a bag. There are so many options. But to me, this is a very potentially low cost or high cost, but potentially very low cost way of becoming memorable, standing out, developing a style. I never had any fashion at all growing up, and now I still don't have any fashion, but I have a memorable style. <laughs> and uh, the last thing I want to talk about around um, fundraising and, and, and convincing people to do stuff for you um, especially in leadership, is this concept of mirror neurons. Anyone out there have, know about mirror neurons? Okay, only a couple, cool. So this is amazing science, guys. Mirror neurons, we all have them, and basically the, the mirror neurons inside of us mirror the behavior and the mindset of the people that we are talking to. So if you walk into a room and you're feeling lousy and stressed and busy and like crap, even if you say, oh, I'm good, <laughs> it's not going to work. It's going to rub off on your team, on your prospects, on whoever you're talking to. Mirror neurons are really powerful. Here's the great news. If you're feeling good and happy, that's also going to rub off. That level of enthusiasm and excitement and authentic happiness is going to rub off. Now, how can you feel this happiness? Some of us struggle with this from time to time. Okay, we all struggle with this from time to time. But I, I believe I have found a couple of really, really powerful hacks for this. And in order to demonstrate that, I'm going to share a quick story about a, a trip to DC I had to meet another potential investor. Um, and I was really nervous about this one because this was one of the owners of the Boston Red Sox. And I was pitching him, um, and this was basically the last big chunk of money I needed to build this company. And I, I was taking a train uh, down to, uh, to Washington, but of course the train was running late, and that was upsetting. And then I get a phone call on the way down saying that with my first company that I had built, we had just lost a major, major client, like a $300,000 client. That was a real bummer. I was in a really bad mood. And I arrived to Washington about an hour and a half before my meeting with this uh, potential investor. And I thought, you know how I'm going to solve feeling really bad? I'm going to eat. <laughs> you know, have a nice meal, feel good. So I found the best sushi restaurant in Washington. And um, I decided it's uh, only a 15-minute walk. I'll get a little exercise along the way, even though it was 85 degrees. So I'm walking to this sushi place in Washington for a nice sushi meal to get me in a good mood to pitch this investor after a really lousy morning. I walk the 15 minutes. I'm sweating, but I'm excited. I'm getting really hungry at this point. I get to the restaurant, and it is closed. And now I barely have time to eat. I, I'm really screwed. I'm in a horrible mood. I'm a few blocks from the, uh, the meeting where I'm going to pitch this investor. And so I think, you know what? I'm just I'm going to walk there. I'm going to get there early. I'm going to try to settle down. And right before I get to the pitch, I uh, run into a homeless person. And he asked me for some change. Now. Whatever your feelings are on homeless people, I think, you know, we all feel bad when that happens. And um, sometimes if I'm in a hurry, I'll, I'll just, you know, keep moving, don't look up, don't make eye contact. But, you know, I made eye contact with him, and then I reach into my pocket to try to get some change. Of course, there's no change in my pocket. And now I feel like a real jerk <laughs> because he's made eye contact with me, and he thinks I'm about to give him change, and I don't have anything in my pocket. So, you know, like, 
you know what, I'm gonna give him a buck. Take out my wallet. I actually don't even have a wallet to demonstrate this anymore, the change of technology. Take out my wallet, and um, of course I don't have a dollar, I don't have five dollars, I don't have a ten dollar bill. All I have is a fifty dollar bill in my wallet. And at this point he's like, I mean I have my wallet out. He sees that I'm about to, about to either give him money or like really, really diss this guy. So I have a quick choice, and I say, you know what? Uh, I'm going to give the guy a $50 bill. Give the guy a $50 bill. And as God is my witness, you would have thought that he hit the lottery. He was so, so happy, literally jumping up and down. So happy, so grateful. He said, I know this is weird, but... If I can hug you, that would be really awesome. I said, sure, sure. He hugged me. And what it did was it completely transformed my mood. I mean, here I was, miserable, and now I was like slightly even more miserable to give away $50. <laughs> and yet it completely transformed my mood. And I realized for the low, low cost of $50, or in this case, I mean, had I had a $5 bill, it would have worked just as well. <laughs> I could change my mood. I went into the meeting. I pitched the investor. He wrote me the final check I needed for $600,000, and off to the races I was. So my hack here for you all if you are feeling down, or even if you're feeling okay, but you want to feel even better, and put those mirror neurons to work before you have a big pitch or a recruiting opportunity of any kind, get high. <laughs> and no, I'm not talking about drugs. I'm talking about two ways to get high. Acts of kindness, and acts of gratitude. It is crazy how powerful each of these things are. So yeah, I have a list of ways to easily do this. I can't always find a homeless person and give them $50. So sometimes I will, you know, hold the door open for the next 10 people. Sometimes I will um, help somebody cross the street. Sometimes if I'm feeling really, really low, I'll call my mother-in-law. <laughs> A true act of kindness. <laughs> Just kidding. Love you, Mom. But it's in those moments of kindness that we get out of ourselves. And gratitude, by the way. And I have thank you cards later for the first 50 people that come uh, find me outside. Free thank you cards so we can all get high tonight together. But in writing thank you cards and expressing gratitude, in acting kindly, we put ourselves in a better mood, we make ourselves happier, and that is what makes us more successful. There is a false myth out there, folks, that if you work really hard and you make a lot of money and you achieve a lot of success, well, then, then you can be happy, and then after that, then you can be grateful. The exact opposite is true. When we are super grateful, then we are happy. And when we are happy, those mirror neurons fire, and we end up being successful. It's, it's, yeah, thank you. It's, it's, it's really simple, drop dead simple, but it, it, for me at least, it has been really, really profound. Okay, promised you guys I would get back to my story and uh, we have to do just that before we close uh, out and we send us all to the orange party. So when we last left off, I was dealing with the very, very difficult uh, situation of being in love with a married woman who was not available to me. Uh, she ended up moving from Boston to New York with her husband to try to make her marriage work. We said goodbye. We said it was too difficult to, to maintain any sort of relationship whatsoever. And I did what I think anyone with unrequited love would do. I went on a reality television show to find true love. <laughs> Yeah, it was a sleazy show on Fox called Paradise Hotel. The, the concept of the show 
sexy singles at a luxury resort, and me. <laughs> hey, made for good television. Um, and if you don't believe me, I have, I have living proof. I'm gonna take you on a trip so far from here. I got two tickets in my pocket, baby. I'm gonna do so. Yes, I did it. <laughs> it was um, a fun, interesting, humbling experience. We can talk more about it over drinks tonight. <laughs> but after, after the show, I was, uh, I was living in Los Angeles, the, a, a, a true D-list celebrity. I was, uh, I was uh, pseudo-famous for a little while and going to bars and nightclubs and malls and getting paid for nothing. I mean, it was actually <laughs> kind of a miserable existence, to be honest. Um, and I was at this um, VH1 awards show, um, and I, I had worked really hard um, to, to let go, but I had a, I had a weak moment. Um, and I guess I wanted to sort of humble brag a little bit. And so, so I called up that woman that um, I uh, had been uh, by the way, if you notice uh, in the progression, we moved from a rotary phone to a flip phone through the years. Yeah, that's true. Um, so I called, uh, I called her up and I said, hey, I don't know what you're doing, but I'm hanging out with, you know, like people from American Idol and stuff. And, you know, what's new with you? And she said, <laughs> and she said well, actually, you know, uh, things didn't work out. I'm, I'm going through a divorce right now. Uh, and I said, oh, my God, I'm, I'm so sorry to hear that. And I, I will, I'll, tell, I'll, I'll admit, I told a little white lie at this point. I said, you know, oh my God, it's a crazy thing because I'm meeting, uh, I have to be in New York next week to meet with my agent, which obviously I had no agent. I mean, I was a reality television person. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, know, you know, we should get together, you know, and, you know, just catch up and stuff. And, um, and we did. And a year and a half later, we got married. on a baseball stadium, by the way, and raised $100,000 to cover the cost of the wedding and a sponsored wedding promotion because I like to do things differently. Um, I'm, I, yes, I'm the luckiest man on the planet. Yes, I married up. Yes, I realized that. We started a company uh, after the wedding and hit the Inc. 500 three years in a row. We sold the company last year for eight figures. And most important, we have three beautiful, beautiful kids. So, so, I already mentioned this, but if anyone wants to get high with me tonight, I got thank you cards available. It really is the best drug on the planet. For, for 99 cents and no side effects the next day, I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. Okay, we're going to do a super quick recap, and this is the moment that maybe if you haven't tweeted yet or shared on Instagram and you want the fancy French champagne, you might want to do that. Get out your phones. Um, and right before that, a quick, uh, quick plug. My latest company is called Apprentice. We connect business people and entrepreneurs with the best and brightest college students on the planet. Anyone that scans that QR code will give you a 20% off, but more important, I'll give everyone a free PDF of uh, my book, The Art of People. So feel free to scan the QR code and we'll give you that free PDF, give you the slides, give you a deal if you're interested in Apprentice. Okay, let's recap. Have the courage to be different. Be passionate and persistent. Remember Brenda Fuentes, call number 37, it might happen. Always take the water. Let go of what we can't control the faster we let go of what we can't control, the faster we can get to moving towards what we can control and making the most out of our opportunities. Sorry, I did that super fast and I see there are people that are taking pictures, so. 
Tweet away. Huh. Ask better questions and then shut up and listen. It's not about you, it's about the other person. And when you are other focused, when we are real listeners, by the way, huge difference. Most people listen to reply. When we can listen to understand, when we're not waiting to reply, but we're waiting to, we're trying to understand and truly present with people, it makes an enormous difference. They, they respect that, they appreciate that, and they will appreciate, I mean, I, I've talked to some people that tell me after 45 minutes that they feel, and this is crazy, I swear to you, it's crazy. They tell me after 45 minutes they feel closer to me than they feel to their brothers and sisters. It's because we're all so busy. Sometimes we don't stop and really listen and really ask those big, important questions. Um, develop a member memorable signature style. I think everyone in this room can go with orange, I'm just saying. Uh, and be kind and grateful. Um, we think that kindness and gratitude is about the other person, but the amazing, selfish, crazy thing about kindness and gratitude is it ends up making us happier and making us absolutely more successful. I thank you guys all so much for having me. And now it's the moment of truth. So I am going to open up my phones and find the fifth person. I got to choose a social network first. The fifth Instagram post with the hashtag next 2023 is going to win. Oh, actually, before I do that, I'll, I give, I'll give a, a, a free copy of one of my books. I brought some books to the first person that I see uh, raise their hand that can tell me. <laughs> can't raise your hand until I finish the question. It's like Jeopardy. Uh, how many phones were there in the slides? How many phones? That man right there. I'm sorry? That is incorrect. Right here. Three slides. Three. Give it up for our... Winner! Okay. And the winner of the fancy, fancy French champagne is one, two, three, four. Doug Eighty Witcher. Give it up for our Doug Eighty at Doug Eighty Witcher. Once again, here's to all of your success and thank you all so much for having me next home.